I will talk about the second part of Neutron Beam Delivery 3. My topics are guide fields and solenoids, field homogeneity, and magnetic shielding. First, I want to start with the guide fields. Um, guide fields are used for maintaining and manipulating the neutron beam polarization. And this is necessary because any magnetic field, for example, stray field or earth field, can rotate the polarization in an uncontrolled way. So this can lead to a partial or even to a total depolarization of the beam. And this is why um, sufficiently strong guide fields are installed all along the neutron path to produce a well-defined magnetic field B over the whole flight path. And um, I uh, go with the laser. So, and um, here you can see in the figure, the main features of the uniaxial polarization analysis. And you can see that the guide fields guiding the beam and its polarization from one element of the from the instrument to another. For example, this guide field here um, will guide the beam from the polarizer, polarizer to the flipper and this from the flipper to the sample and so on and so on. So the effect of guiding fields is that uh, parasitic fields will only slightly modify the direction of these guide fields. And so the total polarization will be preserved. And um, the magnetic fields, which uh, is introduced by the guide fields, can exert a torque on the neutron moment. So here in this equation, you can see that the torque is dependent on the magnetic moment and the magnetic field. And as a, and as a result of this torque, the magnetic moment of the neutron and as a consequence, the polarization precesses around the field and therefore the magnetic fields are perfect tools to control the beam polarization. Uh, but before we start to talk about to how to manipulate the polarization, uh, yeah, I have to talk about the uh, Lamour precession. Um, we already know that a uh, magnetic field um, induces a neutron polarization parallel to B. And in a constant magnetic field, the neutron moment will rotate around the field. This is called the Lamour precession. Uh, with a frequency where the uh, Lamar precession frequency is equal uh, to the geomagnetic ratio multiplied by the magnetic field. And here we have a schematic representation of the Lamar precession of neutrons along B. And uh, the precession angle depends on the wavelength. That means that the dependence on the time uh, that means it depends on the time in the magnetic field and therefore on the speed of the neutrons. So for manip manipulating the polarization, we have uh, two different interactions of the beam spin along its trajectory in an inhomogeneous magnetic field, depending on the smoothness of the gradient and the neutron energy. We have the adiabatic or the non-adiabatic transition. And to know if we have an, an, adiabat uh, an adiabatic or a non-adiabatic transition, we have to, to, to see if the adiabatic condition is fulfilled. So the condition, uh, the adiabatic condition is, uh, is here in, in this uh, equation. And according to this equation, if the direction and the magnitude of the magnetic fields gradually change in a small and in a continuous manner, the adiabatic condition is fulfilled and we have an adiabatic transition. So in an adiabatic transition, the field varies slowly compared to the Lamour frequency so that the neutrons do not really feel this change and gently follows the field during the reversible rotation. And the neutrons experience many turns before the field really changes direction. And as a small reminder, an adiabatic process is a process in which a system is always infinitesimally close to equilibrium. 
Here, the field is changed in such a way that the potential energy of the neutrons is close to its initial value and returns to this value at the end of the process. So the field changes must take place over time interval that is long compared to the Lama period. Uh, to give one example for an adiabatic transition, um, these are the spin turners. Um, we can see them here in the, uh, on the instrument uh, D7 here at the ILL. Um, this instrument is used for studying ferromagnetic materials. And um, we have here the neutrons arrive from the monochromator through the beryllium filter, the polarizer, the flipper, and the chopper. And uh, to the sample in the cryostat here. And from there, they are scattered and arrive through guide fields at the analyzers and the detectors. And behind this copper um, and centered at the sample position, there is a spin rotator. This consists of a cube of three coil pairs to define the polarization direction of the beam at the sample position. The field strength is large enough to enable an adiabatic rotation of the polarization into either the X, Y, or Z direction. But it is not so strong to change the sample magnetization. Um, if the adiabatic condition is not fulfilled, we have a non-adiabatic transition where the field change abruptly compared to the Lama frequency and the polarization vector will process about the new field direction. The precession angle depends on the magnitude of the field and the time spent on the field. To give you also an example is uh, yeah, the Misai flipper. Um, yeah, here you can see a schematic representation of a non-adiabatic Misai flipper used to control the polarization in, for example, a neutron spin echo experiment. In order to produce a continuous rotation of the polarization, for example, for neutron spin echo application, the precession coils, uh, precession coils are used. The simplest case um, these are long solenoids for which the change of the field integral over the cross section is uh, corrected by these Fresnay coils, shown here schematically. But I will come to these Fresnay coils a little bit later. If you want to manipulate the neutron beam um, polarization, you have to be careful of some typical problems. For example, here in this case, um, here you have to be careful with the reduction of the field amplitude at the location where the neutrons see a field rotation. So here the neutrons, uh, the neutron is not exactly following the guide fields you are seeing highlighted in the red circle. In this example, we have a gap between guiding field coils and this can lead to depolarization even when the fields are parallel to each other. And in spin rotators, the loss of polarization generally comes from a region where the, the field cancel, which is also where the, where the polarization rotates. So here we have a re 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 reductance of the strength of the field because the guide fields are re reversed to each other. The next topic I want to talk about are solenoids. Um, solenoids generate a controlled magnetic field through a co coil wound into a tightly packed helix. They produce a uniform magnetic field and a volume of space when an electric current is passed through it. And if we want to have a good resolution, we need a high field and a long integration path, but both will have a drawback. Um, they will produce an inhomogeneous field for finite beam size. And even the most symmetric solution for the main precession coil, the uh, solenoid, for example, will produce an inhomogeneous field for finite beam size. And also, uh, long precession coils are not optimal because they are increasing the, different, uh, the distance between the source and the sample and the sample detector distance. And 
also the counting rate will decrease and, and this results in a bad um, resolution. So to connect these unavoidable inhomogeneities due to the finite beam size, um, Fresnel coils were used. The field integral difference between the trajectory on the symmetry axis and one parallel at the distance r through the solenoid is given by this equation. Here you can see that the field integral difference is dependent on the distance r or r square. And to correct these r square dependence, we arrange current loops in the beam and they are called Fresnel coils. And uh, here in this figure, uh, three Fresnel coils are aligned to each other so that the neutrons with the larger incident angle are added larger com uh, corrections compared to neutrons with a smaller incident angle. Another possibility of uh, correcting these uh, inhomogeneities are optimal field shape coils, also co uh, called OFS coils. Um, they are introducing current distributions on the beam and um, the optimal distributions can be calculated ana analytically and uh, so that the resolution properties of uh, LAMA precession techniques can be pushed to their intrinsic limits. And also wider angular divergences can be used resulting in an improved neutron economy. Here in this figure, you can see uh, the fee dependence of the relative inhomogeneity of the field integral delta dt of d in an uh, OFS precession coil caused from a wide conductor wires. And you can see that the fee dependence of delta dt of d is getting smaller with decreasing the radius of the optimal field shape coils. So um, we sum up that uh, inhomogeneity is bad because uh, we are getting a bad resolution. So we need infinite beam size if we want to have finite count rates. And um, the result of that is that we have different neutron trajectories and um, the field integral for different trajectories are not equal. And so the final precession angle will be different in an echo spin application and the detected polarization will be reduced um, with this equation. So, and now let's consider a uh, polarized neutron beam which enters a magnetic field region uh, B1 with the length L1. Uh, the total precession angle of the neutron is here the first part of this equation. And if now the beam will go through another region with the opposite field B2 and L2, the total precession angle is the combination of the first and the second part of the equation. In case of an elastic scattering event on the sample, where V1 is equal to V2 and uh, B1 L1 is equal to B2 L2, the, the phi total will be zero independently of V and we recover the original beam polarization. This is an echo of 1.0. With finite, beam, with finite beam size, we have different neutron trajectories arriving on the sample and coming to the detector. If the field integral for different trajectories are non-equal, then the final precession angle will be different for different trajectories and the detected polarization and also the resolution even for an elastic scatterer will be reduced like here in the figure. So we can see that the echo decreases with the time. And also the echo will further reduce due to the energy exchange with the sample. The next topic uh, in my talk will be shielding of neutrons to shield thermal and subthermal neutrons. Um, yeah, materials with a high neutron capture cross section are used uh, like cadmium, gadolinium, boron and lithium. 
And with cadmium and gadolinium, the absorption of nutrients is accompanied with the strong emission of gamma rays, so uh, additional shielding is here necessary. For the shielding of epithermal and fast nutrients, um, yeah, these nutrients cannot stop directly, they have to be slowed down first. And for nutrients in a mega evolved region, three types of a material are generally added together. We have uh, one dense material. This is for the inelastic collision. We have an hydrogenated material. This is for the moderation and an absorbing material, which captures the nutrients. One example for this is a heavy concrete in which one finds iron, hydrogen, and boron. Here in this figure, you can see the high energy part of the spectral distribution of neutrons em emerging from the standard thermal beam tube. Now I want to give you some specific uh, examples. So um, for neutron guides and the parts which are um, very distant from the reactor, neutrons are stopped by one or two layers of B4C. For primary casemates, typically uh, typical 80 to 90 centimeters of heavy concrete are used. This ensures the simultaneously protection against neutrons and gamma rays. And for the thermal neutron beam tubes, uh, the optimized shield against high energy neutrons depends on the space which is available. If we have 10 centimeters available, the best annotation is obtained by using borated polyethylene. If there is 20 centimeters available, two centimeters of iron followed by 18 centimeters of borated polyethylene is used. And if we have 30 centimeters available, then uh, we are using 12 centimeters of iron followed by 18 centimeters of borated polyethylene. So the last point um, of my talk will be about uh, magnetic shielding. So we have a magnetic shielding factor, um, which is the ratio of the field strength without and with a magnetic shield installed. And this shielding factor can be split into the shielding factor for, for transverse fields and for shielding factor for axial fields. And for a cylinder, the shielding factor for transverse fields depends on the magnetic permeability, the length, the diameter, and the wall thickness of the cylinder. And for length, so the diameter ratio of P is equal to L divided by D is much bigger than one. The shielding factor for axial fields is given by this equation. So in general, we have three different ways for shielding magnets or magnetic fields. We have uh, the passive shielding, the active shielding, and the shielding via superconductivity. So I want to start with the passive shielding. So um, for the passive shielding, uh, materials are used with a high magnetic permeability, which enclose the magnet, the magnet system. The best geometry is a closed container surrounding the magnet coils. And um, they, this, yeah, this container has excellent transverse shielding properties, uh, but uh, very long uh, cylinders provide almost no shielding against axial magnetic fields. And here in this picture, we have a triple layer, layer magnetic shield uh, made of mu metal. So, but um, yeah, I want to talk a bit more about the mu metals, which are used for passive shielding. So mu metal, a mu metal is a nickel iron soft ferromagnetic alloy with very high permeability. And uh, the high permeability of the mu metals provides uh, a low reluctance path for the magnetic flux. And uh, they are used in magnetic shields against static or slowly varying uh, magnetic fields. But the effectiveness of mu metal shielding uh, decreased with the alloy's permeability, which drops off at both low field strengths and due to the saturation at high field strengths. 
here in the, uh, in the picture, you can see the cryopod um, where the superconducting procession coils will be decoupled by combining Meissner screens and mu metal yolks. And I will explain later what these Meissner screens are. So the next uh, is the active shielding. So the active shielding consists of secondary shielding coils surrounding the primary ones. The shielding coils are designed to produce a magnetic field that reduces the stray field of the primary uh, coils. And uh, however, the active shielding works very well if the diameter of the secondary coil is much larger than the first one. A ratio of the uh, radi of the secondary to the primary one of three to two is reasonable. And here in the figure, you can see a uh, general shield geometry and its configuration. But how is an active shielding working? So we have a magnetic sensor placed in or around the side of the desired low field region. This sensor provides a magnetic field measurement to a controlling system, and this controlling system adjusts the magnetic fields by changing the currents. And then uh, the field is measured again. Here um, on top, you can see an axial magnetic field profile of a long mu metal tube with no field compensation, so with no active shielding. So in, in, in this case, we have just only the passive shielding from the mu metal tube. And you can see that there is almost no shielding. Instead, the earth field is strongly disturbed due to magnetic leaks in the field. Below this uh, figure, we have another one with the same field profile like, uh, like here. And so we have a combination, and here we have a combination of um, uh, passive and active shielding. So that means that the field compensation is switched on. And if you compare the residual magnetic field um, from here to here, you can see that this is much lower. So um, the last thing to, uh, to shield a magnetic field is shielding via superconductivity. Superconductivity is observed in many metals when they are cooled to the temperature of absolute zero, and they have a characteristic critical temperature below which the resistance drops abruptly to zero, and um, they expel all external magnetic flux via the Meissner effect. And the Meissner effect is an expulsion of a magnetic field during the transition to the superconducting state. And uh, this is below the critical temperature and in the field less the critical field. Here in the figure, you can see the magnetic field line, ma magnetic field lines. Um, these are the arrows. And um, they will be excluded from the superconductor when it's below its critical temperature. And if we imagine that a thin screen of a superconductive material, um, we can easily decouple two different magnetic fields from each other. And these screens are called Meissner screens. Here's my summary. Um, my summary about the guide fields. There are strong guide, uh, yeah, we have strong guide fields to maintain the direction of the polarization. And to manipulate the polarization, we have the adiabatic transition and the non-adiabatic transition. For the non, for the adiabatic transition, the field varies slowly compared to the Lama frequency. And for the non-adiabatic transition, the field changes abruptly compared to the Lama frequency. Um, yeah, field homogeneity is important to reach good resolution, and this will be achieved by solenoids and correction coils. And for magnetic shielding, often the combination of passive shielding by mu metals, active shielding by field compensation, and superconductive shielding is used to achieve the optimal magnetic shielding. Um, I also want to thank uh, the expert for material and support, um, Eddie, Lucille, Andrew, Navid, and Peter 
and I want to thank you for your attention.